Welcome to the second lecture of an historical survey of theology and humor. I'm Terry Linvall from Virginia Wesleyan University, and I want to make a confession before we begin. It's very difficult to talk about humor to a computer. It's like juggling before your lawyer or doing shadow puppets before your accountant or just listening to your mother-in-law. It's difficult to get humor across on a computer. So I ask you to bear with me, um, unless I overwhelm you with kind of a fire hose of information, I will try to pause here and there. I will try to imagine you are sitting there in your bathrobes or your later hosen, your Scottish kilt, uh, your knickers, whatever it may be that you're there, which may amuse me and I will enjoy myself more. And I shall try to pause and allow us to think as we move through this together as well. Uh, in fact, if you want to go and get a mimosa and join me, you're very, very welcome. Uh, this is something that will make the time go a little more leisurely and enjoyably. But I have to start really acknowledging uh, with Groucho Marx. He says, essentially, if you keep on talking, you will eventually say something funny. I have 40 minutes. Let's see if Groucho spoke the truth. Where we are today is looking at how God laughs and mocks in the Torah in particular. This also leads us to one of the great poets of American history, and that's Emily Dickinson, who was able to see what we talked about a little bit last week, and that was God's creation. And she wrote this wonderful little kind of gospel poem, but God be with the clown who ponders this tremendous scene this whole experiment with green as if it were his own. And so we come like clowns and recognize that in this creation, there is comedy if we have the eyes to see. And we are blessed to see it when we open our eyes and are awake. Now that also leads to the problem we saw last week is that after God created everything, there came the fall. There came this dissonance that we have with our own world. We recognize, as we said, two things. One, we ought to live in a certain way. Secondly, we don't. And it's very much like that old Yiddish proverb where we see there's things wrong with our world. We realize that this world is not what it should be. And so, if God lived on earth, says the old proverb, people would break his windows something is not right and we recognize that and so we are caught in between in this great incongruity between the way things are and the way we think they should be now next we move to a prophet in the old testament in the hebrew bible who gives us warning against laughter and uh, in his kind of pessimistic wisdom koheleth whom we believe was solomon in his later years after he wrote the book of Proverbs with all of his wisdom, after he wrote the Song of Solomon about all the erotic love of his life, he sits down and in his last years, after going through so many women and so many problems, he writes this wisdom of Ecclesiastes. He was there and he recognized there's a season for everything. There is a time, he says, for weeping and a time for laughing. He says, it's better to attend funerals than festivals. It's better to eat thistles than to eat cake. It's better to be miserable than to be happy. Is it better to be a Baptist than an Episcopalian? That becomes a question we will look at. But he is looking at the vanity of life. Vanity of vanity says everything is vanity. And we're going to see that if he kind of keeps repeating this. But he also gives us some good little nuggets that will tease us into seeing the joy of life. He says, eat, drink, and be merry. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. And tell yourself that your work is good. Now, in the book of Proverbs, Solomon also said, and remember of your young wife, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Unfortunately, we have not heard too many sermons about that, or more marriages may have been saved. But we find also that Solomon warns us of the time. And when he warns us of the time, he says that this is a time for weeping, perhaps, but there's also a time for laughing. Now, even though he says 
sorrow is better than laughing because it has a refining influence on us. He does not seem to be the jolliest person to read when you want to cheer yourself up. He basically says, this is birth, that is death, and then there's all this in-between stuff that we're going to look at. And what is so great about the Bible is that it deals with that in-between stuff and it gives us a sense of both its tragedy and its comedy. The next thing we see, however, are all of those people who belittle and disparage anything that might be comic in the Bible. There's someone like Charles Baudelaire, and he was the translator, as we know, of Edgar Allan Poe, which does not give him really a, a less macabre feeling to what's going on. He, he recognized melancholy in everything he saw in all kinds of beauty. But he once penned that holy books never laugh to whatever nation they belong. We are going to go against Charles Baudelaire, and we're going to see if they do, in fact, laugh. Also, another fellow who brought this up was the great mathematician and process philosopher, Alfred North Whitehead. And allegedly, he said, the total absence of humor from the Bible is one of the most singular things of all literature. Now, he's a mathematician, and he should have found something funny in the book of Numbers. But unfortunately, philosophers do not find things funny. We'll find later on that Erasmus says, if you want to ruin a party, invite a philosopher. All that he or she will do is sit around and have an oral disputation with you. If you ask him to dance, he will look like a camel. So stay away from philosophers and move on to the next group we have. This is another scholar whose name is J. William Whitby. And Whidbey wrote a great book called The Bible and Comic Vision. And he basically celebrates the kinds of laughter we find in the Bible, and particularly the Hebrew Bible. He says, at times it is mocking and ridicule. At times it is joyous and reveling. It is subversive laughter, and it is celebratory laughter. But we need to know how to recognize that laughter that is there. The Bible is not a comic book or a joke book, but studying it unveils this wonderful comic vision. Also, he goes on to tell us that there are four interrelated characteristics of literary comedy in the Bible. And we're going to look at each one of these as they apply to the Bible. The first is looking at plot lines. What is the narrative? Can it be a tragic narrative or a comic narrative? Second, character types. There are classic comic character types that we are going to find. Third, there are all kinds of linguistic puns and games and riddles that we can enjoy kind of deciphering. And finally, we find that the Bible gives us comic functions. Comedy works to do something in human nature. And here is this little kind of a uh, story on Christopher Vogel, who wrote kind of the Bible for Hollywood literary structure. Uh, we have all of these events that he kind of maps out. Uh, They're almost in a Jungian way. And now the little fellow says, we've had our inciting incident, which is the beginning thing. And now we're on the journey. So it seems like we'll be having a crisis any minute now. To which his wise, taller companion says, the quest was a lot more fun before you got that book on story structure. Hopefully we will not ruin the comedy of the Bible by looking at this story structure. But we look first at this idea of a plot line. The plot line is there. If it ends with a happy ending, it is a comedy, no matter the difficulties or the problems that we see at the outset. In fact, most comedies begin with an obstacle or a problem. Now, what we find is what Northrop Frye called a U-shaped curve, where you start with something that is good and normal and ordinary, and then the disasters happen. Then the problems begin to mount up and complicate your life. And you move down to the bottom of this U shape. And what Northrop Frye finds is that there are many of these U-shaped curves, comedies in the Bible throughout. And each one, you start with the story of Abraham that we'll look at in a little while. And things begin to go wrong for him once he leaves the land of Ur. 
and once he begins to realize he's getting old, he's not having a child. He's got a nephew named Lot who gets involved in Sodom and all of these things go wrong. But we find that God is faithful and at the bottom, at the nadir, at, at this kind of really worst part of his life, things begin to turn around and move upward to where he is able, he and his wife Sarah give birth to Isaac. We find the same pattern with David, with Solomon, with all of the prophets of the Bible, where there is a word that is given and things get worse before they get better. And this is also the whole shape that we'll see also in the Bible, where Northrop Fry says, this entire Bible is a divine comedy. And it's contained, he says, within this U-shaped story of this sort, one in which man, as explained, loses the tree of life and loses the water of life at the beginning in the garden. But then in the book of Revelation, the tree of life and this living water come back to him. So you find this wonderful end where you end at the top again. As Cicero once quipped when he was talking about using comedy and humor in rhetoric and persuasion, he said, if you want to make your audience laugh at the end, make them cry at the beginning. And so we create the problems and the tragedy of the fall at the beginning of our story. But we still see this great code that is going to show us this comic structure that is there. And here next, we have this kind of image of, of what this looks like. We start with the creation where everything is wonderful and good and green and fertile and fecund. And then the fall comes and we lose all of that. And so the life of the whole human race goes down until we get to the, to the bottom, which is the crucifixion, which is the death of God himself. But with the resurrection and with Pentecost, we see the promise of a new life that takes us all the way to a new heaven and a new earth that is there. Now, the next thing we can find just kind of an aside is that there are U-shaped curves even to your life. Uh, look at your life and generally what have been found in psychology is that married people uh, do much better than single people, but many of them also have this dip, have this bottom of their U-shaped curve in the middle years when you're between 40 and 60. But as you become older, things become better. Things are put into perspective and you realize there is a virtue in perseverance that is there. But we also move on then to the second characteristic beside this plot structure. The second characteristic is basic comic human types. They appear from anyone like a fool and a trickster to an old buffoon. Even animals like Balaam's ass can fill a role. A key character that we're going to meet is Jacob. Jacob the deceiver, Jacob the trickster, Jacob the Picaro. The Picaro is kind of an individual comic type like a Charlie Chaplin who wanders along. And as he wanders along, he gets into all kinds of mischief, but he makes it out in the end. And so we're going to find these comic types throughout the story of Jacob and even in the story of Esther. Now next, besides this kind of trickster, we also have comic villains. And we find many of them scattered throughout the scriptures as well. There's the very obtuse foreign king Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, because of his stubbornness and his pride, he is condemned to be a fool, even to eat grass like an ox. And we find him there. In the next image given to us by William Blake, uh, we see even, even more that he becomes mad, almost like King Lear. And, and in this madness, he becomes the buffoon. He has his own fool beside him, but he doesn't listen. And so he becomes kind of a classic stupid fool that is there. But we also find too, within this comic character, a comic function. And one of the key comic functions of scripture is that the mighty will be brought low. We will see this particularly in the New Testament when we have the Magnificent of Mary, who recognizes that God takes the humble, God takes the lowly, and he lifts them up. And then he takes the proud, the administrators of the world, the faculty of the world, the philosophers of the world, and he brings us down and humbles us. Third, one finds linguistic games and jests that delight the reader. Um, there are so many kind of word plays on words that we find with different languages. 
Uh, if you know your Hebrew and your Greek and your Latin, you'll catch some of the nuances, nuances that some of the translators of King James did not catch. And many modern translations just try to kind of pave over them. But they are there. Malachi, for example, means my messenger. And so God calls the prophet messenger to be his messenger that is there. And we find all of these puns uh, in the Hebrew Bible. Even in the creation story next that we find, there are several linguistic puns in Genesis. And they bring together several meanings, this incongruity that makes it funny. There are wordplay hints of divine comedy, fusing together kind of words like man, hadam, and earth, hadama, hadama, Adam. Adam and earth are the same. Uh, and if you have a husband and he's a clod, you recognize these two words are the same thing uh, that is there. But we also find a pun on a woman. A woman's name, Ishta, is the same as Ish, a rib. And so it is out of Adam's rib that we receive the woman who comes forth. The next two, like Latin, Hebrew, like Latin, the language kind of sneaks in a lot of wordplay. Um, what is known as paranomasia. And it's often lost in translation, we say, and it's crucial to understand the text. For example, one of the most basic is we are human, and that relates to the fact that we were taken from the clay and the earth, the humus. It is the humus, this earth, this clay, which makes us who we are once God breathes his life into us. Also, we find there are certain word plays in scripture that are not in the Bible. Women aren't supposed to make coffee. The Bible says, he brews. I'm sorry, we need those in every now and then to just keep us awake. And maybe it's time for a little mimosa before we move to the next one. Mm. The puns on the Hebrew names that we mentioned are ubiquitous. Um, and here we go from Hebrews that God makes the men brew the coffee, not the women. We move next to other puns, such as Cain, meaning wanderer. Cain is divinely ordained to become a wanderer. And he, leads, he wanders into the land of Nod, which means the land of wandering. And so you see this wonderful kind of building and playing on top of each other that is going on. Uh, one of my favorites is Shem, which means name. And the sons of Shem want to make a name for themselves. And so they recognize the futility of even their name is not yet a name. Uh, this reminds me of the, of the old story of the four clergymen and their wives who went to heaven. And they were standing at the gate and St. Peter looked at them and he looked at the first and he said, you Episcopal priest, you Episcopals are so gluttonous and drunkard. You drink all the time. All you take is the wine. In fact, the old joke goes that whenever you have four Episcopalians, you could easily find a fifth. But not only that, you Episcopalians drink so much that you went out and you married a woman named Sherry. To the Presbyterian, he said, you are so proud. You have your institutes. You talk about total depravity and predestination. And when you could have married a beautiful and irresistible woman named Grace, you didn't. You went out and married a woman named Destiny. To the Baptist, he said, you are so greedy. You loved meeting. Your favorite sacrament was taking the offering, was tied. In fact, you loved money so much that you married a woman named Penny. And finally, the Pentecostal preacher turned to his wife and said, Fanny, I think we better get out of here. So names, names are very important. Even the Tower of Babel parodies the act of creation. And what we see is that the people trying to become like God begin to babble themselves. And it's quite the opposite of Pentecost where God comes down rather than man trying to build his way up. Now the next thing is we find different categories of, of jokes there. Sarcasm, we find from Exodus, when the Egyptian, when the Israelites have left Egypt, they're in the desert, and they say to Moses, was there a lack of graves in Egypt that you took us away to die in the wilderness? They begin to mock their leader, Moses. There is irony 
after enduring all of their complaints, God looks down and he gives the children of Israel so much quail that it comes out their nostrils and becomes loathsome to them. He pulls, he says, you want more meat? Here's more meat and so much meat. There's mocking. Psalm 1 talks about those who sit in the seat of scoffing, and it's worse than those who stand in the way of sinners. God, however, in Psalm 2, looks down at them and laughs them to scorn. God mocks them. And then finally, we'll be looking later on at parody, where there are forms of prophecy like Jonah. But Jonah takes everything wrong, and Jonah does not behave like a prophet as we see, and it's a lesson of what a prophet should not be. Someone who runs away from God, someone who denies God. He does the opposite of everything, but he succeeds. Most of the other prophets have problems having anyone listen to them, but Jonah is so successful that all the people of Nineveh not only listen to his message and repent, but so do the livestock, and they put on sackcloth and ashes as well. So the next and the thing is to look at this kind of idea of satire, classic satire. Classic satire requires a standard against which you're going to measure everything else. It says, this is the way it should be, and satire comes along and says, let me show you what it's really like. And so here, there is the Swiss Army knife. You can change it, and it becomes, in the next click, a Southern Baptist knife. Now, how is it different from the Swiss Army knife? Yes, there is no corkscrew. But go to the third category, and we see an Episcopal knife, Swiss Army knife, and it has nothing else but the corkscrew. And so we see this combination of wit and moral purpose addressing all the people. Then finally, next we get to what Whitby calls people to recognize the comic functions of the Bible. Comedy subverts our expectations. It subverts the status quo. It looks at people who are at ease in Zion, and he says, I'm going to show that you shouldn't be so comfortable. But it also conserves, conserves that which is really good and holy and right. So weapons of satire are used in comedies for correction. Isaiah uses quite a bit, uh, as we'll see later on. And, and one of his famous lines is he's looking at people who think that they are in control of their own destiny. And he says, is the ax to boast himself over the one who chops with it? Or is the saw to exalt itself over the one who wields it? Or in our time, we would say, is the fishing rod able to boast that it catches the fish? Or is the golf club able to say it hit a hole in one? We, as the instruments, think that we are in control. And God is there through his prophets to kind of mock us and to work through us and reveal to us what we are. The Bible was not written to amuse, but to reveal. But revelation can come in the form of humor and satire. It doesn't have to come in the form of a serious lecture. It can come in a way that we can laugh at ourselves and change. We human beings are such stupid, stupid saws or dumb axes. In fact, that's the original version of being a dumb ax. Next. What we're going to see coming up now is, is what is known as the Midrash. And the Midrash is basically a way of interpreting the text. And we have been given from the rabbis a wonderful model of how to approach the text. Um, and, and there are great rabbis like Zornberg who has pointed out that it helps us to read the Bible, the sacred text, with a very true understanding available to us. Not one that's conventional, not one that's platitudinous, or one that is even pious. We come so solemnly. In fact, C.S. Lewis said, too often we come with this holy kind of style, this very solemn style. And the scriptures are not to be approached like that. They're to be approached in a way that we come and grapple and wrestle with them and play with them even. Well, uh, one of my old friends um, was Rabbi Leon Klinecki, who came down to Virginia Beach once. And uh, we were talking about humor and Jewish humor versus kind of Protestant humor. Uh, Catholics have probably better humor than Protestants. But he looked, he says, Terry, you should read your gospels with a Jewish Brooklyn accent. They will sound less solemn. 
instead of the Southern Baptist style of speaking the scriptures, if we begin to let the scriptures come through different accents, we see the comedy of it as it comes through. Next. Aaron Freeman and Sharon Rosenweig have looked and created what is known as the comic Torah. And here in the comic Torah, they, they play, they do a midrash of the text itself. Uh, Yahweh is basically a female who has green skin. She loves grilling. And that's why we get the book of Leviticus with all the kind of kosher laws that are there. Uh, but she has an awful temper uh, towards her people. Moses plays her servant in, in the book, and he's part of this kind of multi-ethnic cast of characters. Uh, even Barack Obama appears playing Joshua when he leads them into the promised land. Yes, we can, uh, Canaan. Yes, we can. And he takes the people in. And so there's a lot of playfulness that is there. Uh, next, we see kind of another example of what they have done uh, in, in this comic Torah where they reimagine the good book. And it's one of the laws. If your wife of your embrace tempts you saying, let's go worship other gods, which neither you nor your far fathers have known. Investigate, ask thoroughly and inquire. You may read the Torah and she's reading L.L. Bean, L.L. Burn. And you recognize that there is a fire to come if you follow her leading. And this is a warning to all young men. Next is also kind of a, a sense of Woody Allen kind of retwisting the Torah when he says, some guy hit my fender and I said, be fruitful and multiply, but not in those words. Even a bad Jew like Woody Allen who has lost much of his foundation still can find in the humor that is there in the scripture. Then we move next to another kind of very controversial character from the 60s, uh, Robert Crumb, who did a lot of the underground comics. He took the book of Genesis and he translated it literally. He took the literal words, but he created an adult version of this first book of the Bible. And by looking at it, it, it is close to sacrilege at times, you think, because it is so explicit. But at the same time, it opens up our eyes to understand have I been reading the text differently? Are there things that I am close to that I need to see? But also, we find in uh, Mark Russell's God is Disappointed in You, a kind of a sense of spark notes or cliff notes on the Bible, where people are coming and trying to understand the Bible from different ways, of trying to move us out of our straitjackets. It is not going to destroy the truth of the Bible. The Bible will hold on to its truth, but it's nice to kind of look at it obliquely, to look at it out of the corner of our eye. Next, we move to some very classic texts, and we'll move through these quickly. Uh, Jamalti has done a wonderful kind of study of satire and the Hebrew prophets, how Amos and Hosea have used satire to kind of correct their audiences who have gone astray. We find others uh, like dealing with Balaam, uh, Balaam and his ass, and Jonah that we'll look at later, who use this kind of sense of parody and satire, again, to correct their audiences. Also, Conrad Hires looks at the Bible in the same way that Northrop Fry did, in kind of a large narrative, how God creates laughter out of his, his people. And Albert Radcliffe looks at the Bible as real comedy giving us hope. And in times of difficulty, in times of quarantine, in times of suffering, there is this comedy of hope that still speaks to us through the people there. But two of my favorites next come from Frederick Beekner, a Presbyterian, and when he writes Peculiar Treasures. And here he looks at all the quirky characters and people of the Bible who are God's own peculiar treasures. And then Doug Adams has looked at some of the shadier stories of the family tree of Jesus, whether it's Rahab or Tamar or Ruth, all of these women who come from outside and yet are part of this wonderful heritage that will ultimately give birth to the Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. But next we find a more recent book, and that's Old Men of the Bible by Craig Wansing, cartoons by John Lawing. And the authors of this book have taken some of the stories, and they've taken license, but they begin to look at these stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, David, Solomon, Hezekiah, 
when they're old. And what does the Bible tell us about these men when they are old? They're irascible, they're cantankerous, they're drunk, they're vindictive. They have lots of problems. And it gives us a lot of hope because you recognize these men are included in the book of Hebrews Hall of Fame of Faith because of grace, because of God's grace to them and not because of anything righteous. Sometimes we think we should get better at the end of our lives and yet we look at our lives and we feel we've fallen short still. And so Old Men of the Bible gives us that hope of looking at real characters. The next thing we see is there are reasons the Bible doesn't look comic. And that is because some people take the Bible, and back it's in a black binder of all, it looks very dark and foreboding uh, that is there. And they take that Bible and they use it as a sword the way it shouldn't be a sword and just stabbing people, yelling at people, and talking at people. But next we find this idea again of Midrash. And what I wanna do is go through just a series of cartoons that are basically looking at scripture in an odd way. And they're giving us commentaries about things we know and things we haven't really thought of. When we read the Bible, it's not like the Quran, which is God. For us, the Bible, are the words of God that reveal the living word of God. So the small W's of God, the small words of the Bible point to God himself and God in the flesh. And so we hope through this cartoon to realize we've got to meet the author. Next, we find that when you go into the Bible, you better be prepared to meet the author, that the author will not leave you alone like Francis Thompson's poem, The Hound of Heaven, once God gets into your imagination and into your reason, he will meet you. He will meet you along the way in some unexpected ways. Next then, we find that there are people who look in the Bible for loopholes. And this is in honor of W.C. Fields, who remember on his deathbed kept flipping through the Bible. And they ask him what he was doing. He says, I'm looking for a loophole. Of course, you can't find it. The Bible is going to speak to us. And there are many things that we don't understand in the Bible, but there are many things that come and are very clear. And as Mark Twain said, it's not the things that are obscure that bother me, it's the things that are clear that really get me. Next, we find that even in studying the Bible, we become, we, be, we, become re, we realize that we're part of a larger family, that we are part of a greater design. We know that in ourselves, we were made for a purpose. Even the fact that we know that we should live in a certain way and we don't, we know that we were made for a purpose and everyone else is too. That's why whenever you look at your neighbor, you have to realize that God designed that person. That person may be the part of the puzzle that fits right next to you. Next, of course, God has his own mischief. And what he does, he gets medium-skinned people, dark-skinned people, light-skinned people, insects, amphibians, birds, reptiles. And then just to make it interesting, he throws in a couple jerks. And you have to realize that if you don't know any jerks, you can guess who the jerk is. But most of us, in one way or another, are slobs or we are pains in the bottom to someone else. And God put us there. G.K. Chesterton once said, he said, God told us to love our neighbors and to love our enemies. Probably because they're the same people. When you look at the people that you have the most conflict with, they are generally your family and the ones you are closest to. But that's God's way of just sprinkling in some jerks ourselves into your community. In the next cartoon, it says that on your resume, you were created in God's image. Very impressive. If only we had eyes to look at one another in the same way, to recognize that this living resume, this living CV in front of us has God stamped on it, it would shape our behavior to them. We might even fall on our knees and realize this is one of God's own. And hopefully they would do the same for us. Also, we have the difficulty in scripture of wrestling with whether or not this is a loving God or an avenging God. 
Many people say that the Old Testament is just the evil God, and the Gnostics did that. Gnostics like Marcion. He saw the God of the Jews as the vindictive God. Not so the Christian. The Christian looks back with the Jew and sees a God of Hesed, Hesed of loving kindness, of mercy, of grace, and all of these good things. The love of God is there. And then we look in the New Testament and we see judgment as well. You cannot go to this cuddly, lovely, dovey God of the New Testament and think that's all there is. When you look at Jesus, Jesus divides the goats and the sheep. In fact, one of the great stories about Fred Rogers, who was one of the most godly Presbyterian men uh, you'd ever want to meet or see, he gave so much of himself. He saw everyone as his neighbor, and he loved everyone as his neighbor. But he asked his wife, Joanne, as he was dying, he said, am I a sheep? Am I to be included among the sheep? And the reference was to this idea that Jesus divides the goats and the sheep. And the sheep are those who, when they saw the least of God's people, loved them and reached out to them. And so this man of gentle comedy was able to be a sheep and not a goat. Next, we find, however, though, that we still wonder about God's judgment. We look at other people who suffer and we say, has he smit them? Is he going to smite us next? But there is a sense in which judgment is a lesson to us. There is a kind of a warning that we see and we have to be alert and we have to listen. And most of us grow too lackadaisical, too slothful, too apathetic. And so when we see a death, a death wakes us up and says, what is going on? And yet at funerals, we find often more comedy than we do at other places. Comedy is there to kind of show us that God is not yet finished, that death has been defeated, but it is not fully buried. Uh, there is that wonderful old story of three ministers who were asked, what do you want the minister to say at your funeral? And the priest said, oh, I want him to say that I was a good Irish priest. I took care of my congregation. I fed the poor. The minister said, oh, I want the minister to look down at me and say, oh, he was a good preacher. He touched so many people in positive ways. He was there to help when people were sick and to pray with them. And the Jewish rabbi said, oh, I want the rabbi to look down at me and say, oh my God, he's moving. So at funerals, there is this potential comedy. There is a sense in which we will be resurrected. We will come back to life. Next, however, we still feel in our prayer life that we're on the phone with God and we wonder what he is doing. What can God be doing up in his heaven? And we discover and we think we discover that he's off playing and not paying attention to us. But he is actually listening. Now, next we move to the fact that God does the talk show circuit. And he tells us in this great cartoon, I think my best creation was the sense of humor. The irony, of course, is that the people who claim to believe in me the most are the ones least likely to have one. And so that becomes a problem for all of us who do not recognize that God is playing with us and God is calling us to rejoice in him. G.K. Chesterton, the great Catholic saint who helped influence C.S. Lewis into his conversion, said, it is the people who are not sure of their God who are afraid to laugh in his presence. Most of the holy people that I have known will even laugh in their prayers. There is this wonderful conversation that goes on between them. But we move then finally to the last cartoon in which God looks at us and looks down and he says, don't make me come down there. Fortunately, he did come down. And this is the good news from all the tragedy that we have created, that God comes down and becomes one of us. Now that just leads us to another form, the next form, which is this extra biblical comedy of Noah's Ark. And I wanna take us through Noah and then take us through Abraham and we will be done for the day. And just a whole series of jokes and cartoons come through the story of Noah. In fact, when you go to children's rooms, nursery rooms, you go to church nurseries, there are so many pictures of the ark. Uh, the ark is always there, and children are taught about the ark. They're not taught about the destruction that happens before 
or taught about what Noah does after he gets off the ark. And so we look through the next cartoon. Uh, we find that Noah means rest and Nahum means comfort and relief. And so Noah was looking for this relief after 40 days and 40 nights on the ark. Uh, it floats on the water and he finally gets off. Um, in spite of the problems that Bill Cosby has had, he still has the best Noah ever. And when God has a conversation with him and he says, Noah, yes, Noah, this is the Lord. Right. Who is this really? He carries this conversation on in a way that we begin to understand what it would be like if God spoke to us. But he also gives us a sense that Noah was a human being that really didn't quite know what he was doing. So as we go through these cartoons, we see in the Disney cartoon that the animals get on the ark two by two. That's what we've learned about them. Uh, in the next one, Disney did another film, kind of a, a live a a stop action film, where his penguins kind of move together, all dressed up in tuxedos. What these cartoons do is they domesticize the Bible. They make it comfortable. The story of Noah should not be that way. So we move to the next cartoon, and it adds even more comedy to these penguins because the penguins have to decide which two are going to get on. And they do rock, paper, scissors. Unfortunately, with just flippers, everyone only does paper. Next. But on the ark, to waste the time, to pass the time, knew, Noah knows it's going to be a long trip, so he let them keep singing 99 bottles of beer on the, on the ark. Next, they moved into their rooms, and there were some accommodations that were not quite convenient when the ant and the anteater are put side by side in bunk beds. Or next, when the two rabbits had a room of their own. And what happens with this is then the rabbits get into a very biblical tradition of begetting. Begetting is a very interesting idea that very few people talk about. I was once asked at a church to give the reading at Christmas on the genealogy of Adam begetting Cain and Abel, begetting Seth, begetting all the way down to the line of Jesus. And as I began to talk about begetting, I had to open my scripture reading by telling all of the congregation that basically begetting is about sex. All of these people had sex to beget, to bring somebody about. I was never invited back to read scripture at that church again. But we move on from the beginning of rabbits with each other to where Noah in this kind of German cartoon is lecturing the rabbits for getting around a little too much. And so begetting takes its mind of its own. But next we move out to those animals we wish had not made it. Uh, where you get a church marquee wishing that those two mosquitoes had been taken care of quite early. Of course, the snails took their time, and Noah wondered if he would even make it on. The dinosaurs, we wondered what happened to them, but they had a good deal on a carnival cruise. And then there were some people that snuck on trying to be polar bears. We wonder what animals they were and why the unicorn is extinct. Several reasons. First, they kept asking those questions. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And so Noah reads his book of Leviticus on game recipes. Of course, Leviticus hadn't been written yet, but he's still looking for what he can serve. Or the two unicorns break up. Their relationship just couldn't take the carnival cruise. The dinosaurs also recognized that they just didn't have it on their calendar. When it's done, the Almighty is going to put a new thing called a rainbow as a promise not to drown everyone again. And then Ham talks to his brother Shem. Shem, that unicorn's going to make a run for it. Oh, it's too late. It's too late. And so the unicorn is no longer with us. But we also see a final irony that allegedly came out last year on May 25th, where the Washington Post announced that Noah's Ark theme park was destroyed by a flood. 
Of course, this was actually fake news, but it's such a wonderful irony that we couldn't afford to pass it up. The fact that even an amusement park named after a place in Genesis would not last. Now we move to the great comedy of the book of Genesis. And this is the story of Abraham. I want to call it Everybody Loves Abraham, but the story is really about Sarah. Sarah is the key to this whole story. A woman is the foundation of comedy. In fact, the place to start is with an old woman laughing. The old woman is in the desert and she's wrinkled like a cactus. She's bent over, she's hunched over, and her eyes are squeezed shut, and they're squinty shut, and she's laughing, and she's doubled over. The old woman is approaching 91, and she's just been told that she's going to give birth to a baby. That there is going to be a nursery and a nursing home. The old woman's name is Sarah, of course, and the old man's name is Abraham, and the two are wonderful geriatrics, and they are going to be the one who are going to give a baby through Medicare. Now we look at the story here, and the story is put out by Handelsman in what a little thing called Freaky Fables, a wonderful little book of cartoons. And Abraham is talking to his wife, and she says, suddenly at the age of 85, you want children, don't bother me, we have servants for that. Ah, and Hagar's in the back singing, I'm just a gal who can't say no. I'm in a terrible fix. I always say, come on, let's go. Just when I ought to say, nix. And Sarah looks and goes, no fool like an old fool. Abraham goes, Hagar, honey. And then they come back. And she says, you did it. You actually did it. I didn't mean for you to did it. You spent an infinitive, says Abraham. Call him Ishmael, says Hagar. Peekaboo, coochie-coo. Say hello to Grandpa, I mean Daddy. Now, 13 years later, God appears. He says, I'm the Almighty God. I know, says Abraham, that's why I'm falling on my face. Here's what I want you to do. And he gives him a word. Next. Wife, guess what God just told me? To take up jogging? No. Where's my hacksaw? I have to get circumcised. Abraham, we are from God, said three angels. Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. Ha! She laughs behind the door. Called Isaac. Great, he says. I didn't laugh. I coughed, said Sarah. One year later. Look at that, Ishmael. What great strides are being made in gerontology. Yuck, yuck. Those two have got to go. And a few years later, where are you taking Isaac, says Sarah. I have another message from God. I'll explain later. Abraham, don't sacrifice him. I was only kidding. What a relief, Sarah would have been furious. And Isaac saying, I want to go home. I don't like this game. And then it came to pass after these things that Abraham learned that he had two nephews called Huz and Buzz. Nahar and Michael should have had their heads examined. Huz and Buzz indeed. Better that than nothing, I suppose. Actually, those are two names in the Bible. So the moral is trust in God. He has a great sense of humor. But next, what we find is that Sarah is the source of all of this. Now, in a little book called The Mother of All Laughter, it's kind of the prayer of Jabez meets Seinfeld, a, a book about nothing, about pregnancy, and everything else. And so taking a midrash, I found five verses in the book of Genesis that deal with Sarah, with laughter, and with God. The first verse is, Sarah laughed to herself. The second is, God said. Why did Sarah laugh? Third, Sarah said, I did not laugh. And God said, yes, you did. Fourth said, God said, call the child Ishak. Call the child Isaac in Hebrew laughter. And fifth, and Sarah announced that everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. Now, looking briefly at those five, the first thing is Sarah laughed to herself. What do 90-year-old women pregnant in the desert laugh about? Primarily their husbands. And here she's looking out from behind the door in Jan Provo's great painting, and she says, well, I once again have the pleasure of this old man in my 90s when I never had it in my 20s. She is there ready to laugh and realizing this is so wonderfully incongruous. It's so beyond what could be expected. But next, we find Chagall, 
has created this picture of Sarah laughing with the angels about her. And God says, why did Sarah laugh? And Sarah says, I did not laugh. She denies her body. She denies what God is doing because she's afraid she's wrong. But God comes back and he affirms her and he says, yes, you did laugh. Yes, this wonderful affirmation. Yes, he is the God of yes. He said, you laughed. But that is right and that is how it should be. Also, we find at this time, did Abraham wear boxers or briefs? The answer depends. Who knew what Abraham wore? Just the fact is he was able to get up in the morning and have a baby with Sarah. The Lord says, call the child Isaac. Isaac means laughter. And so God not only approved and enjoyed, but he participated in this. He said, you're going to call your kid laughter. That when the role is called in school, that they'll come through Linda and everyone else's name, but they'll get to laughter and he will say, hear and laugh loudly. Next, we find the laughter of Sarah and another old man. But this is a very old joke of a good, good man, John McCain and Sarah Palin. But they're not that old. Next. Finally, she says, and everyone who hears of this will laugh with me. There is a community of laughter. Everyone is coming together to share in the birth as they do. Comedies end in births and weddings. And this is one that really does, that is so improbable, but is so wonderful. There's an old Yiddish joke that was left out of my book by the editors. And um, it's Sarah, uh, Abraham comes home one night. He comes home and he says, Sarah, Sarah, we have been so faithful. We have persevered that tonight God has promised us super sex. And Sarah says, at your age, take the soup. So we go back to the illustration and we see that it is the soup. At your age, take the soup. The sex can wait. There is another old story, though, kind of that I learned from another Jewish rabbi friend. And a Jewish grandmother is walking on the beach with her grandson who's wearing a little sailor outfit and cap. And suddenly a rogue wave comes in and sweeps the grandson out to sea. And the grandmother is very distraught. She looks at the sky and she pleads, oh, God. I've always been true and faithful to you. Please bring my grandson back. And with that, another wave comes in and deposits the little boy safely on the shore by her feet. And the grandmother once again looks at the sky and says, he had a hat too. We close with comedies of mistaken identity that we're going to see. Abraham pretends that Sarah is not his wife. He actually uses that Henny Youngman line, take my wife please, when he meets Abimelech. Jacob pretends and masquerades as his brother Esau. Laban substitutes Leah on Rachel's wedding night. David pretends to be a drooling lunatic in the foreign court of King Ashish. And there is a baby in a manger who is not who we think he is, but he is the son of God. And Jesus is mistook as a gardener by Mary and as a stranger on the way to Emmaus. There are so many masks and masquerades and so many kind of potential comedies that we see as we go along. And we end with these kind of few stories that happen at a well. There are romantic comedies that happen in the Bible. And one of the first is when Eliezer is sent out by Abraham to fight a, find a wife for his son Isaac. And where does he go to meet Rebecca at a well? The well is the place where you find this fresh water, but it's also the place where you find the women. Also, you find that wells function as bars and pubs of their day. Jacob meets Rachel and Leah at the well. He goes for a drink and there he meets the women. And when he meets the women, he recognizes this is where he is supposed to be. And so we find in Jacob, to kind of bring us full circle, these four elements. There is the you story of Jacob, when he starts off having deceived his brother and his father, and he runs away, and he goes to Laban. He ends up with two marriages, Leah and Rachel and their concubines, plus lots of begetting. But finally, he goes back home, and he's reconciled with 
Esau. We find the character types. We find that Jacob is a trickster. We find that his father-in-law is a buffoon, that he is tricked with all of this genetics of the sheep. And then we find linguistic games where Jacob actually means supplanter or heel, and God gives him a new name, which means Israel, one who wrestles with God. And then finally, the comic functions are there, the comedy of transformation. Jacob is changed into Israel. Jacob is delivered, and there are wonderful things that happen. And so next, we find that we will come now to Moses. After we've seen this great comedy of Moses, of Jacob, we come to Moses. And Moses finds Zipporah at a well. And so we conclude that one goes to wells to quench your thirst, to meet women, and to get into fights. The book of Proverbs says, drink from your own cistern. A woman becomes a well. And we'll find that even Jesus meets a woman at a well who tries to come on to him. But that's another story. So next we will meet the final stories in Genesis of moving from Moses to King Solomon. Thank you, and we will see you then.